Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to our continuing series where we talk to people on the left, people on the right, professors, scholars, philosophers, and reporters just trying to get down to what do Americans think about political division. With us today, it is our pleasure to have Professor Todd Zwicky. He works at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University. Uh, George Mason University Foundation Professor of Law and George Mason University Antonin Scalia School of Law, Research Fellow of the Law and Economics Center and former Executive Director of the GMU Law and Economics Center. 2020 to 21, he served as the Chair of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau Task Force on Federal Consumer Law. In 2021, he was inducted into the American College of Consumer Financial Service Lawyers. He served as a chair of the American of the Association of American Law Schools section on law and economics from 2019. Uh, Professor Zawicki clerked for the Judge Jerry E. Smith of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit and worked as an associate at Alston and Bird in Atlanta, Georgia, where he practiced bankruptcy and commercial law. He received his JD from the University of Virginia where he's an executive director of the Virginia Tax Review and John M. Olin Scholar in Law and Economics. Uh, he has been awarded the top 50 most downloaded law authors at the Social Science Research Network, both all time and during the past 12 months, and is currently ranked in the top 10% in total downloads for the field of SSRN. He's also appeared on the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, Sports Illustrated, Washington uh, Times, Forbes, Nightline, National Review, NBC, and the nightly news hour, Jim Lehrer. Uh, he has also testified before Congress on issues of consumer bankruptcy law and consumer credit and is a frequent commentator on legal issues in the print and broadcasting media. Uh, with us today is Professor Todd Zawicki. Professor, did I get anything wrong with your bio? Did I say anything wrong? Do we need to correct something? I think you, I think you covered more than enough. Uh, okay. It's great to talk with you. Okay. Uh, I appreciate this. I had spoken with your colleague, Alan Mendenhall. We had, I know Alan for a decade. We had a great conversation on political polarization in America. And that's how I was able to contact with you. So let me get to the meat and potatoes. You, you are an American or you live in America. I'm imagining uh, you've yeah, been here. Both. Okay. Imagine you've been here for the last 10 years. Um, I also imagine that you have two eyeballs and they work. Yep. And you have a professionally trained brain. Now, your expertise is in economics and law, but you're still a professor and you're trained to think a little bit more critically about these issues. So let me ask you some of the big meat and potato questions. In your opinion, uh, can I ask you how old you are, professor? I am 57. Okay. So you've been around a while, half a century. Uh, yeah. Been okay. Around. Worked in the government a couple times also, as you mentioned. So. so you have experience in academia. You've been in America for half a century, and you've worked in the federal government, and you've talked uh, to judicial clerks. And, and you're, So you've worked at the academic level. You've worked at the law level. You've been a citizen. How bad is political polarization now? Is it not that bad? Is it bad? Have we had periods like this before? And nah, it's fine. We'll get over it. Or is it, damn, I never thought I'd see something this bad in my entire life. And we're here now. And I don't even know how to fathom it. Which one's the correct opinion you may hold, Professor? Well, what I would say is uh, clearly we've seen worse times. Uh, it, we obviously fought a civil war, uh, which was uh, pretty uh, polar polarized and divisive. Um, and, you know, we've had radical movements in this country. And in many ways, the 1960s um, seemed much more threatening. And I don't remember the 1960s personally, but, but much more threatening than we have now, uh, which is, you know, people are blowing up buildings uh, and things like that. And it really looks like uh, in many ways the country was falling apart but here's what i see and what gives me anxiety is the trajectory and unlike those issues um the fundamental underpinnings of society um seem to me to be moving in the wrong direction uh which is to say if we take the 1960s for example um during the 1960s it was very divisive over the uh the vietnam war uh, but 
most of the elite institutions of American society in the 60s still pretty much believed in America, right? There was still a general consensus that although the United States was a uh, clearly imperfect country, it had a lot of uh, legacy of uh, injustice uh, uh, and the like, most of the uh, Americans, I think, still believed in America, right? Uh, the corporations, uh, the uh, permanent bureaucracy, the media, um, Hollywood, right? I mean, we had um, a sense in which uh, we could emerge from that because we kind of had the regenerative power uh, uh, to, uh, to to right ourselves. What worries me now is that the elite institutions, rather than stabilizing society, rather than um, providing sort of a, um, a sense of uh, stability against sort of populist uh, currents, today it is the elite institutions that are accelerating. Um, they are the leading edge of prompting this divisiveness. Uh, the academy, um, the the things we've seen about, um, you know, the we'll call it the deep state, right? Uh, the weaponization of uh, the FBI, the media, Hollywood, uh, social media, um, the churches, uh, even the even the military um, and the corporations. Um, and so, what we have now, I think, is relatively unprecedented, uh, which is we've got sort of the populist fervor we've always had, but we have an elite that is fanning the fuels of divisiveness um, and uh, profiting off of it rather than being a stabilizing force that can exert a counterweight uh, in, a, in a positive direction. And so that's what bothers me is things have been worse um, in the, the past. But what I see now is a trend, um, a sort of grinding away um, and an erosion of the fundamental underpinnings of belief in the United States and belief in the sort of commonality of Americans to believe in the principles of the, uh, of the United States. And so that's where I get nervous about uh, the future of polarization and where this is headed. Let me repeat back something I've heard from others, and please tell me how close it is to what you just said. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. I have talked to a couple of people, and I'm 46. I didn't live through the 60s, but I love history, and I read a lot about it, and I've read a lot of what official historians say, and they say, wow, that was a pivotal period in American history. But what I've heard from people is, yes, the 1960s were more violent. There were things being blown up, people being shot, Kent State Massacre, et cetera, and we don't have that yet hopefully never the difference is though in the 1960s as polarized as people on the left and right were they all still believed in the authority of the courts in the elections of the president um, in the authority of the congress and right now we have the lowest uh support or faith in every single federal institution in america except for the military in 40 years so the faith in congress the faith in supreme court the faith in the presidency according to Pew Research, is the lowest it's been in almost half a century. We also deal with one side in 2016 will say, I don't think your person won for the next four years. Then the other side right. will say, I don't think your person won for the next four years. And then we also have people say, I don't care what the Supreme Court says. I'll just defy their rulings. Right. We didn't have that in the 1960s. You didn't have somebody go, I don't think Nixon won. And so for the next four years, I'm going to pretend like he did it. Oh, yeah, I don't think McGovern won, and I'm going to act like that, and I don't care what the court says, and who cares what Congress says. They kind of had a common belief in these institutions, so there was at least some underpinning, some utter undergirding that held these disparate peoples together as a nation, and we don't have that today. Um, and I think that's right, right? And I think, uh, you know, my, my view is is that this lack of trust in the governing institutions is a reflection of the uh, underlying um, uh, uh, ideological currents and kind of the rot in society. More and more Americans now judge what they consider to be a legitimate outcome of uh, government processes by whether or not they agree with the outcome. 
right? Right. So, I mean, a good example was if you take, for example, some of the stuff that happened um, around um, some of the BLM stuff. I mean, a great example was this case in Kentucky where um, where the grand jury decided to indict that one police officer for that uh, that tragic shooting and didn't indict others. And people got outraged. Now, here's what's fascinating about that is grand jury proceedings are confidential, right? We literally have no idea what was presented in the grand jury proceedings, right? By law, right? No that's that's supposed that. to be that way by law. It's that way by law, okay. right? And the only judgment that a large number of people were willing to make was, well, I saw a clip on CNN that made me think that these guys did something bad and so they should uh, be prosecuted, right? That, that belief that the fairness of the system, the fairness of the election, the fairness of the courts, any of that sort of stuff should be determined simply by whether or not I agree with the outcome, that is a uh, that is a very dangerous um, um, approach, a very dangerous mindset for a free society because the free society rests on really the idea of sort of fair procedures, right? Uh, whether it's with respect to free speech, whether it's respect to election procedures, uh, uh, and, and that sort of thing. And, uh, um, and, you know, that's really eroded. And so I think what we're seeing with this distrust that you're describing is a reflection of these, uh, these underlying currents um, in society. Recently, we saw the Durham report come out. Um, yeah. And I am not a fan of Trump. I'm a liberal. But as I always say to conservatives, I have two eyeballs and they actually work. Just to let people know where I'm, I'm at. So not a fan of Trump. He made my mom cry. However, okay, okay, fellow liberals. So we're not going to get be friends. So fellow liberals don't come after me. But the Durham report basically backs up what Trump said. They made up the accusations that he was in collusion with Russia. Did Russia interfere in the election yes did they try to help trump yes did he consciously work with them no there's zero evidence of that at all and that's what the left and hillary clinton was saying it's a total lie the durham report came out and said that's a total lie which backed up the Mueller report it also said hillary clinton straight up used campaign funding and lied and got the fbi in on it and they improperly used the fisa process to go after a political rival because they all didn't like him I would also remind people to remember the Peter Strzok FBI agent uh, text messages. He was part of the Mueller investigation and said straight up, let's get him. So liberals, before you attack me, these are facts. You don't have to like Trump. These are facts. This happened. Okay. These are facts. Trump bad. These are still facts. Trump bad. These are still facts. Okay. Both can be true at the same time. Does one political party reaching out to the security apparatus of a government and working with them to attack another political opponent when there's no real evidence just because you don't like him, does that help stability in America or does it do the exact opposite in your opinion? Professor of law, professor of law. That's what we lawyers call a leading question. Um, I'm, for, I'm not a professionally uh, trained lawyer. I don't know what I'm doing. Just asking that's questions. That's right. It's, it's a very dangerous uh, development. And, and here's the thing, you know, which is uh, um, not you know, cool. You know, there was a poll, a, a poll done in 2018, for example, by, by YouGov. And two, thir- uh, by two thirds of Democrats thought expressed in this poll that the Russians had literally hacked into America computers mm-hmm. and altered vote tallies yep. to get Trump elected. Yep. Right. And what I find so um, alarming is if you were to take a poll today after the Durham report has been released, I would predict that a majority of Democrats would still say that Trump colluded with Russia, despite the evidence in the Durham report and everything else uh, uh, that that we know, right? Uh, Which is um, there's a sense in which the the, the truth of a lot of this simply doesn't matter, right? Uh, Trump's uh, um, uh, lawsuit in Georgia contain multiple paragraphs that are essentially cut and pasted from Stacey Abrams' 2018 lawsuit challenging the results of the uh, the Georgia gubernatorial election. And so this is one of these things where we're kind of in this tit-for-tat 
uh, kind of situation where if one side's going to weaponize um, the government, if one side's going to, um, you know, uh, um, lean on social media to, uh, to to censor things and do the kind of things that we're seeing, it basically puts you in a in a zone that Trump understood, which is the only response to that at some point. For and you know, for most people, is well, we've got to push back, right? We've got to, we've got to, we've got to push back in our own way, and that's you know, sort of a Hatfields and McCoy uh, situation where the original divisiveness, the the unwillingness to acknowledge the legitimacy um say trump's uh, election you know go back we saw the electoral college stuff before that creates a you know like a, a law of gravity creates a response on the other side um that just seems to be going up and up and, and up um uh, and we see this uh, like you said with the, the supreme court and the delimitization of the courts and everything else and traditionally We've had a way of sort of saying, all right, you've got a point, you've got a point, right? Let's figure out, you know, and in many ways, again, I think this is the, the elites would come together and they'd say, we have a, we have a, a duty here to, to try to reach some sort of consensus, to preserve the, uh, the underlying fabric of the government um, in, in society to resolve these sorts of issues. And that's becoming increasingly difficult now, I think. Uh I want to ask you a question, but first I want to acknowledge uh, what you said about Stacey Abrams. Thank you for bringing that up. A lot of people will not recognize that point. And so again, I don't like Trump, but for a fact, Stacey Abrams did the exact same thing Trump did. She was not criticized by liberals or Democrats for doing it. She did it before Trump. You never heard about it when liberals would talk about how Trump did it. So Stacey Abrams said, I doubt the results of this election and I don't concede. Okay, do you have proof? No, but I'm sure I'm right. And then they did an investigation. It didn't come out in her favor. And she still said, yeah, I'm sure I'm right. That's literally what Donald Trump did. Literally what what he did, did. the same thing. And I don't excuse what he did either, but Abrams did the same thing. Not a peep from the entire left while she did it and while they were accusing Trump of doing the same thing. You never heard about her because she was their darling. They, They can't, she was the... New and upcoming Democratic new face of the rising South. They can't talk bad about her. But what that also means is that you have conservatives listening to this and going, you don't really care about fair elections. I might believe you if you went after Abrams with as much gusto as you did Trump, but you didn't. So now I don't even believe you're serious about that. And then our faith in a common system goes down even further. You're not helping anybody. You're only bringing down America when you don't acknowledge what your side did to is wrong. I have no game in this hunt, I don't care. Uh, But I'm just saying, when you don't acknowledge what your side did, all you're doing is telling the other side, have even less faith in fairness and even less faith that I will see you as a common American. And here we are, surprise. And by the way, Abrams did it before Trump. Where do you think he got the idea from? In the sense of legitimacy and commonality of Americans tends to feed on itself, right, which is that cooperation begets cooperation and trust. Um, and this sort of activity begets sort of a tit for tat response on the uh, on, on the other side um, that over time starts to take on its own momentum. And that's what I see happening here and what I what I uh, what I fear, um, you know, and a lot of sort of and there was a sense with Trump where sort of trivial um, things that, that he did were lumped in with serious things he did. Right. And right. So now there's a sense among, I think many conservatives that, you know, oh, this is just another thing, right? This Which is just hunt? another sort of concocted uh, um, uh, plot. Um, and so, you know, you look at things that are very problematic, like, uh, you know, what happened with the, the, the election and, and that sort of thing, that uh, um, that 
kind of get lumped in with a lot of sort of trivial things he did, like, you know, the first impeachment trial, I think, um, over that Ukraine thing. Um, the idea that that would be the kind of thing that we would impeach a president uh, over, right, is is very troubling, right? Impeachment should not be just another political weapon, right? Um, it's, it, it's a very serious uh, uh, proceeding um, that uh, um, really, you know, goes at the heart of, uh, of constitutional uh, a government. And so I think we really need to be careful about, you know, using those sorts of uh, uh, techniques to score political points uh, and the like. So not a Trump fan, not a Trump fan, not a Trump fan, not a Trump fan. I consider myself a liberal ex-Republican. But let me ask you a question. You are a professor of law. I am not a lawyer. You've already pointed out how I, you know, I'm, I'm on the law as well as you do. Great. That's why I wanted to talk to you. I heard, though, and I was wondering if you could maybe help me out here. I heard there's this thing called the appearance of fairness. And that that was also important in the law that, yes, you could have the is it legal? Yes or no. But that lawyers in the past, going back centuries, used to think the appearance of fairness was as important as the strict application of the law, the thing I reference most is they got a statue in front of every single courthouse, folks. It's a woman who's blind holding up a scale of justice, which means she's not supposed to be biased or have any preconceived conditions. She just weighs the um, data that comes in and decides fairly. I remember when justices would recuse themselves from cases even though they right. felt it was a good case, even though they felt that they had what it took, even though they felt that they would be unbiased because they thought it would look improper and that would right. erode public trust in the system of law. This used to be concern. Now what I see is let's have the FBI raid Donald Trump's house. Right. Let's not say what it's about. Let's have the news guess it's nuclear secrets, then it turns out to not be nuclear secrets. And then the attorney general goes on TV and goes, well, I did everything wrong. I mean, I did everything right. Don't look at me. I did everything right. And I'm like, wow, does that breed confidence in the public? It looks like you're trying to cover your own ass rather than tell the public you did the same thing. And then it's eight or 12 different secret document locations under Biden and not one FBI raid. And when I talk to liberals, they're like, well, <coughs> Trump argued with the FBI. So that's why he gets a raid. But Biden admitted they did the document things, and that's why he doesn't get a raid. And I go, Biden admitted it after they went after Trump. Right. Coincidence? Accident? And let's say that it is all correct. Do you really think half the country is going to buy that? You did an FBI raid on a former president. The other president did eight times the amount of the same crime, and he gets no raid at all. Maybe that was legal, but to me, that looked highly improper. And all that does is encourage people to not have faith in the legal system. Liberals didn't right. care. Now we have the Durham report. And it right. says the FBI did not play fair. I got to imagine that the FBI can't take too many hits or the Justice Department without Americans basically having no faith in the application of law um, being impartial. Uh, how important is the perception of fairness to the law? Is it a concern? Has it been a concern? And is it okay for us to just throw that in the trash and not worry about it anymore? Yeah, I mean, obviously, the, the legitimacy, political legitimacy rests as much on perception as reality, right? Do people believe that the government is acting honestly and fairly uh, and, and the like? Um, and so because we, we usually don't, you know, the Durham report kind of gave us a spotlight on something that, uh, that we kind of didn't know about, right? So we didn't know for sure, right, uh, what was going on. And now we see the kind of thing that's going on there, right? And now when the FBI says, well, it's no big deal because we've changed all our, our processes, right? I don't think a lot of people believe that. And then what we see instead is the FBI doing some things that are hard to explain, you know, like with uh, the PTA board meetings, you know, mm. and all these, all these sorts of things. But it's, so a lot of it is, it, so there's kind of two sides. One is the public perception that legitimacy rests on the belief of the public 
that what the government is doing is legitimate. But the second thing is, is the government and these elite institutions have a lot of power in society. And those of sort of my ilk, right, uh, professors, um, government officials, politicians, that sort of thing, um, it was always understood that with that power comes responsibility, right, mm. which is to be prudent, to use judgment, to be concerned not just about the short-term political gains that you're going to get, but that you have a that you have a, a, an obligation to uphold, um, you know, the the, the tradition, uh, you know, the, the decades or centuries of credibility that have been built up in universities and the media and that sort of thing. And what we see now is sort of um, uh, people in those positions of trust are just, you know, sort of drawing down on that capital, right? Using it for these short term well said. Uh, political goals. And I think, you know, like I'll, I'll just give another example outside of law. Think about public health, for example, right? Where we saw right at the beginning of the, uh, the COVID um, pandemic, uh, public health people, you know, everybody attacking these people who are protesting against lockdowns. And then just a couple of weeks later, these much larger uh, and unruly uh, um, demonstrations uh, in support of BLM, where they said, oh, well, that's all great, right? Um, Thank well, you. If yeah. Public, if wow. You're a public health official. Yeah. You know, your credibility rests on the idea that we believe you're looking at science, you're looking at public health and not just weaponizing your prestige and your stature to advance a political agenda. And so I think when that starts off right out of the bat with that happening, it kind of telegraphed right from the beginning that a lot of this was uh, was politically motivated and didn't really have anything to do with public health. And then they wonder why people don't trust <laughs> the public health officials yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, anymore, right? And you'll never and so, see that mentioned. You'll never see when they talk about uh, skeptics. I'm going to try to avoid the key words so that we can be sensitive to YouTube. But the big thing right. we just went through where everybody had to stay home, uh, right. they will try whenever they talk about skeptics of that, they will never, ever. Yes, I'm a liberal, but I got two eyes. They will never, ever bring up that they said stay indoors. And then uh, uh, a man who should not have been executed was executed exactly. by the police right. and that is wrong right. and horrible and they should and people have the right to protest but we just said hey all of our lives on the line and that's then there was right. all these blm protests and i remember the health organization came out and said oh that's cool so yeah, right. you you can't right. you can't tell people how dare you question our thinking when they straight up lied to your face and early on when this whole emergency happened i'll just leave it there we're not going to get into it um right. I do. Uh, so the appearance seems to matter. It's important. And, oh, uh, this was it. Uh, before before you come on, I just need to make a comment on this. There are many awesome FBI agents. There are many awesome police officers. I respect law enforcement. I respect people who are dedicated to do it. But that's also what bothers me is that I've met FBI agents and I have family in law enforcement. They don't get helped when people in their organizations many pay grades above them do stupid things like this. You make right. hardworking agents and officers jobs more difficult when you right. play games with the public trust. So I want to say, be very clear. I support the officers. I have criticism with the administration. And I think that yep. that problem makes life bad for all of us and right. for the officers. Okay, please right. continue. Sorry, I needed to get that out clearly. No, I, I agree with that completely, right? And and the thing is, is society is complex, right? The issues of modern society are complex. And people, Americans have to have confidence that people at the highest reaches of government and you know that sort of thing are actually taking their responsibilities seriously, right? Uh, that they are doing their best um, to, to live up to, uh, you know, the, 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 the trust we repose in them, whether it's the media or, uh, or uh, the FBI or elected officials uh, and, and that sort of thing. And when that trust 
erodes, when that trust is undermined, it is really hard to to restore it. Um, and that's that's the concern I had at the beginning, right? Which is, it seems like we're on this downward spiral where um, where these things kind of reinforce each other over and over again and kind of point us all in one direction. And um, and that then just continues to feel real, more and more polarization um, and more and more conflict and, you know, it makes us less and less able as Americans to come together to actually do things that are essential um, uh, for, for the long term, you know, functioning and flourishing of the American society. Yeah. And, and I think for you watching, I think you saw that the two of us had a lot of criticisms for uh, the actions of some law enforcement agencies, but we had a lot of love for the people in those agencies and we had a lot of hope that reform could happen. I want to make sure that was framed properly. Yes. Um, see, that's, that's, I just, because I get to oh, the cops, this, the FBI, hold on, let's be specific. And because I see people talk, right. Russia, this, China, that, yeah. I got a problem with their government. I don't have a problem yeah, with their people. You, talk, you know, I've got some, I've got uh, several friends who are police officers all around the, around the country and they talk about how difficult it is to do their job now. Right. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, that, that what we end up doing is when we can't, when we feel like we can't trust uh, um, our public officials, we end up bureaucratizing and imposing a bunch of rules uh, on them. Right. Mm -hmm. And so much of governing, whether it's policing or the media or academics, or rests on judgment. Right. It rests on people sort of being, you know, using good judgment, recognizing the trust uh, uh, that, that they have, and for the good ones. They get tied down by these rules, right? That are that that tie their hands from actually doing their jobs and looking out for people and carrying out the trust that they've assumed in these uh, in these positions. Um, and so, what you end up with is, unfortunately, I think you start seeing starting to see this tendency where kind of the bad apples start to drive out the good apples, right? Uh, it's not and, good. Uh, it's not good. Yeah, we have, I'm in Fresno. They have a huge problem getting law enforcement officers here uh, right. because of all the protests. And we've, uh, Fresno doesn't exactly have a clean image um, uh, as the police department goes, but it, it made you, the, the police chief literally went to the news and was like, I'm begging for officers because I, I can't right. find them and, and we're going to have trouble policing. And I was like, wow, that's pretty bad. Uh, right. as, and, and, and veterans. Military recruitment and we, you know, oh, and the, so yeah. All, oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. And just real quick that it's you used to have a lot of people come out of the military and go into law enforcement, whether that's good or right. bad. It was there. And a, a lot of people in the military are minorities and they would go yep. into law enforcement, which was great because then we have people of the communities being policed as the police officers. I totally support that. But with the BLM riots, you started to see, I think the Pentagon even issued a statement where they they told the cops, stop wearing military fatigues because you're <laughs> ruining recruitment and you're ruining the loyalty of Americans to our military. That's a national security threat, folks. Really, really bad, like a Russian missile strike. When our young boys and girls are beginning to think, Maybe I shouldn't be loyal to this flag and this uniform and this branch that I'm part of. Bad, bad, bad. Right. Right. Pentagon got scared by the BLM riots right. and the reaction. And, and don't get me wrong, right? I mean, it's important to recognize that that there have always been people who have misused the authority and the trust. Of uh, course. And, and George and Floyd was murdered, right? and that was wrong. Of course, and that was wrong, and there have been bad judges, and in all these, uh, uh, all these, th these things, right? Of course. But uh, um, but now, when you have this rampant distrust um, uh, in our institutions, and an unwillingness of people to respect the legitimacy of the outcomes of these processes simply because they don't like the results, even if fair processes were were used uh, uh, in the like, that becomes very problematic uh, in terms of the stability of a, of a free society. You heard it. How, just a few more questions, if I may. How, sure. how far back does this go? 
Um, maybe you don't have a scientific answer for that, but you've been around, you've been alive. Um, when did you start to notice, and I, and I get it, some people have said we've been always polarized from America from the beginning, or we've been polarized going back to the 70s or whatever. When did you notice, just a point in time, a point of observation, when did you notice, you go, yeah, that's a, uh, I used to not worry about this. And then and now I'm thinking there's a concerning trend. It couldn't have been this year or last year. You had to have noticed something before. When did you start gathering an inkling? Yeah. And it's been like a snowball rolling down, rolling down the hill. Right. Um, personally, where I first started getting queasy about this was honestly during the, the Clinton administration, right, where there was a, um, uh, you know, during all the impeachment stuff and you know, all that sort of stuff, where a large number of people basically said, it doesn't matter what Bill Clinton did, right? It doesn't matter that he, there was an allegation here, for example, of uh, when he was governor of, uh, of uh, Arkansas with respect to Paula Jones and that sort of thing. It's important that we rally around Bill Clinton because we like his policies, right? We like the results that, uh, that, uh, that, that he has, right? And that was kind of the germ of something then that I saw um, when George W. Bush was elected, right, and Bush was Hitler, right? Uh, oh, and, yes. Uh, to, yes. To, to many people. Yeah. That's where we saw the first challenge in the Electoral College uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, Bush's um, um, uh, election and claims that, you know, that there was fraud in the Ohio balloting results and that sort of thing, right? And so that idea um, started. I would say then the um, the the complete misuse of uh, you know the the, the, the terrible uh, decision of the way they decided to get into the Iraq War right uh, on the huge uh, failure of the national security apparatus there I think probably helped to uh, to to accelerate that as well right mm -hmm. but each of these things starts off as a drip and a drip and a drip and that becomes a uh, becomes uh, you know some raindrops and then it turns into a thunderstorm as these things kind of uh, come down with respect to the judiciary it's pretty clear to me that the pivotal moment in that was the uh, Robert Bork hearings um, back in the 80s. Oh, right? where nice. Bork was um, where, you know, they went after Bork uh, with completely over the top uh, dishonest attacks on, on the man, right? I mean, you could have a dignified uh, process uh, for judicial appointments and that sort of thing. But there was sort of a an inkling there that that sort of um, politicians um, and and, you know, activists and that sort of thing saw, oh, we have a new weapon here. Right. We've got a weapon here of sort of character assassination um, that, um, that that we can that we can use. Right. And that and and they and they won. Right. In some sense, they defeated Bork on the basis of the perception that they created about uh, created about Bork. Right. People could vote for or against Bork, but it didn't have to be the way that it was. And I think that is where these big fights over um, the judiciary kind of went back to. And that was a very pivotal moment to me. That was when I was in college and getting ready to go to law school. And I remember that uh, very vividly. Um, and that kind of sat for a while. And now we've seen this ratcheting up of, uh, of judicial appointments um, and this perception of politicization of the judiciary and judging the legitimacy of uh, results of, uh, of courts by whether or not we like the results or not. Um, and so these are things that kind of have some roots um, that um, when they work, they tend to, when they when there's a perception that they work to gain short-term political advantage, um, opportunistic people seize upon it, right? And that's exactly what Trump tapped into, which is, you know, he had a perception this would work, right? Uh, even if he, you know, that it would be something that would be good for him, right? Um, and so he jumped on it, right? And we'll see if it works not right but that's that's the idea right which is once you start deciding that attacking the legitimacy of institutions will benefit you in the short run um then you that's when i think you start seeing this opportunism um ar arising um in this erosion of trust okay we're winding down last uh two questions 
but I, I want to remind everybody, I, we're talking about the responsibility of power and that when it is abused, things don't work and trust falls and then societies fall. And I think we need to give credit to the great scholar, um, Uncle Ben, who was the uncle to Spider-Man, who taught him that comes with great power, comes great responsibility. I believe he was the first academic to mention this. I could be wrong on that. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look and we'll fact check that, but uh, we wanted to give credit where credit's due. Thank you, Uncle Ben of Spider-Man fame. Um, last question. Yes, I'm a huge dork. Okay, I think I've already admitted this. So um, all my friends in high school, you couldn't be my friend in high school unless you knew all about Star Trek and could argue about who was the best Starfleet captain. So let's just just make that straight. Anyways, does this get better? Do you see without some godlike figure or aliens coming down and uniting us all together um, like Bill Pullman when he was the president in um, that alien invasion movie, outside of some magnificent, stupendous development that we can't see at this moment, do you see any reason why polarization would decrease naturally on its own in the future in America? Um, I, I wish I could <clears throat> say yes, but, uh, but it's hard for me to see the scenario where that happens. And, you know, I'll talk about an area that I'm most familiar with, which is academia, right? Uh, which, you know, academia has a huge influence um, on society because we educate the students come after us, right? And there was a <laughs> pivotal moment after Trump got elected um, where for about 10 minutes, academics said, oh, maybe we should understand this phenomenon. What is it that caused so many people to support this uh, this man who we despise, right? right. That's basically what it was. Now, that soul searching lasted 10, maybe 15 minutes, <laughs> um, at which point then the, uh, the universities decided, oh, we discovered what the problem is. The problem is we allowed too much free speech in our in our schools we we allow people to actually think and express these ideas in society and so what we really need to do is double down on repression right <laughs> we need to become even more doctrinaire we need to be work for the nazis more forceful in suppressing speech we need to be even more forceful in suppressing you know misinformation uh on uh, on social media and blasting out the uh the messages we want people to uh to to receive um and that i think was really a pivotal moment where these institutions um could have taken the signal that that a lot of people saw and said trump has tapped into something here some degree of alienation that uh, a lot of people have some fear of distrust some sense that uh that the elite institutions are not really looking out for us and unfortunately all of those institutions responded the exact opposite way right uh um again the media the social media the uh the, the, the government officials politicians all these sorts of people basically decided that the answer was um to to try to double down on repression of those ideas and so i think yeah i mean there's still a potential for um the leaders in society to uh um, try to take a uh, a hand in rebuilding um this trust right to uh, to live by their own rules right and we saw that during the pandemic of all these politicians who you know the gavin newsome example being yep. a classic example right of one rule for you one rule for me right or french laundry who supported uh, uh school closures uh that you know disproportionately harmed lower income kids while sending their kids to private schools gavin newsome made open the whole time um and um you know and a lot of these things i mean a lot of it you know is it, i think a lot of it is that uh which is that that that, that that there are you know that having people who act responsibly um and are concerned about actually maintaining the trust of their organizations uh the corporate ceos the good uh, government uh um people the good academics all those sorts of things that's the best i've been able to come up with which is a pretty thin read, unfortunately, right? Um, and, um, but, you know, 
Um, but I, I can't come up with a, a, a better explanation of how this doesn't just continue to unravel. My biggest concern that a lot of people think is fine is that somehow we just kind of divide into sort of two different cultures, right? Red states and blue states and all this sort of thing. And and that really bothers me. Um, you know, the I think there's something uniquely valuable about the American project, right? And the way in which America has been this great uh, society where anybody could come to America and anybody could become an American and succeed and, you know, just be judged by their character um, and whether they're good people and that sort of thing. And, um, and, and, you know, and that requires um, a, a character in the public in each and every one of us um, that uh, um, is, is hard to build um, and hard to sustain and um, easy uh, to to surrender and hard to, to build back up. And so um, I wish I could say I'm optimistic. Um, I've got a daughter. Um, I've got two sons. Um, and, you know, I worry about, you know, I'm, I'm 57, right? I'm going to be able to retire in a few years and, you know, go walk on a beach somewhere. But I worry about what we're what we're leaving for our uh, for for our kids, right? And whether we're building a society and a set of character attributes where they have the same attachment and the same desire to to build and maintain this uh, this society that's been built up over so many centuries. They had the election in uh, twenty twenty, and um, I've been in politics for about a decade. My family really isn't, and they think I'm a little bit insane for doing it, which is not totally untrue. Um, but afterwards, my brother called me after the election and he sounded all frantic because he's got a daughter too, my niece yeah. and she's approaching 10 and he was thinking about the future. And he's like, Hey, I, the, things are so divided, man. It's bad. I, I got the solution. And he walked me through how we just need a third party. And I listened for 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I listened for 20 minutes because I didn't have the heart to tell him your solution ain't ever going to happen. And go back to right. worrying about the future for your daughter. So I just listened and I go, oh, that's interesting. And we ended the call. And I was like, you know, the people who are apolitical are getting scared about the right. climate. I mean, my most of my family is apolitical. My brother certainly is, although he's well informed. Um, but, you know, he was generally worried. And they're grasping for solutions that will never work. Oh, let's just uh, get rid of the Electoral College. Sure. Right. And let's have 35 states be politically neutered forever. By the way, you have to get them to agree to politically right. neutering themselves before that'll happen. Oh, I know, let's do this. It's just, it's all, there's no, people are looking for a, a quick slap on sticker to uh, put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And I think it requires con, con um, difficult surgery. Uh, yeah, and, 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 you know, everybody, you know, I travel a lot, I speak a lot, I've talked about a, a lot of different things, and um, a lot of people have gimmicks out there that they think are going to be sort of the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the magic ticket that's going to solve these problems uh, in, in some way, but... Um, but I think that that's just uh, delusional. Um, we've gotten to where we are by some pretty, um, by, some, by a pretty deeply rooted um, and strong trends that have developed over time. And just pruning the bushes above the ground, I don't think is going to um, solve the problem so long as those underlying dynamics um, are still uh, still present. I get the feeling, and this is just a theory I have, that after Marjorie Taylor Greene said, let's have a national divorce because left and right can't live together, I saw a lot of newspaper articles come out and they go, well, it's it's extreme politicians. Well, it's social media. Well, it's gerrymandering. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting because there's this thing called the big sort that goes back to the 1990s. And what it says is that Americans don't like each other and they're moving to ideologically similar communities whether they're doing that intentionally or not there's some debate sure but they're doing it and no one mentioned that there was like 30 different articles talking about why are we so divided elite media uh gerrymandering and um elite politicians and i go how come everybody forgot the big sword the big sword goes back to 1992. social media wasn't a problem until maybe 2015. elite politicians weren't a problem or extreme politicians until the last two years of trump's administration after he gave them a lot of ideas the big sword predates both those ideas by two decades and yet nobody could mention it and my feeling is 
it's depressing. Hey, these are big problems. I know if we could just pass a law to fix the social media companies, if we could just pass a law to fix gerrymandering, if we could just pass a law to have more reasonable politicians. There is no law to pass to undo three decades of 300 million people sorting themselves out. Right. That's a long, and, and, painful you know, and process. I'll, and what I'll say is, you know, you're blessed to live out there uh, in um, my friends know I live inside the Beltway here in D.C. And, um, and you know, people generally got along in D.C., right, uh, uh, historically, right? People could be Republicans or Democrats, but you socialized with each other and you basically – you know, uh, all those things were kind of part of what you believe. There was no different from being Protestant Catholic, essentially. But over the past, during the 25 years I've lived here in D.C., the environment among people has just become toxic. Um, the, the, you know, even people who aren't directly involved in the government, this has just become sort of so much a part of who of how of their identity and judging people as to whether they're good people or not based on their political views and that sort of thing and that's not marjorie taylor green's fault right that is something about um people about about the people right and you know hopefully the rest of the country isn't as bad as it's got here inside the beltway but it seems to be moving in the same direction uh from from what i can tell and, and i think that's the underlying sort of toxic dynamic that uh that that bothers me is uh, um the, the interpersonal antagonism and lack of trust between uh between people that um, kind of really undermines this ability to solve all of our problems and kind of regenerate um and you know uh, uh society uh I'll, I'll back you up on that so i remember boehner uh john boehner was uh speaker of the house for the republicans during the obama administration and at one point he complained that people were getting really nasty and he'd be on newscasts going you guys could be nicer to each other and they laughed and laughed at him and oh that's so funny he can't handle it and Vayner is going no 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 i don't think you get it i've been here i'm an institution i've been here for decades it has never been like this we need to calm it down i understand we don't like each other but you got to calm down this rhetoric and it's it's like angry and mean with each other all the time it's never been like that this is a new thing he was bringing up that it was new and in return for that he was laughed at for being weak you can also fast forward it to or spin it even further back with Newt Gingrich. As I understand, Newt Gingrich came in and there was a pattern of you're a Dem, I'm a Republican. Okay, we'll argue right. during the day, but at night, our wives both know each other and we'll have dinner and wine and, you know, some port in the evening. And Gingrich said, no more socializing with people yep. from the other party. So we have people on the right who did it, Gingrich, and then we have people on the left who did it. Um, basically, everybody who worked for Obama against uh, Boehner. And both right. times nobody really clued in they just kind of like, oh that's interesting moving along yeah. and i'm like what if we had paid attention at those moments and said we're losing some of our civil institutions and instead of mocking people or ignoring it we should pay attention to those things now we can't yeah it's too late and it's 20 years later and I, think, and I think the pandemic um and the way in which um uh, the, you know, the, the social isolation first in the pandemic, but then also sort of the, the demonization, um, the, the conflict uh, around that, um, I think was a, you know, was a real accelerant uh, for, uh, for a lot of these, um, these frictions um, among people. Okay, we're going to leave it there. You have been awesome. Let me ask you the last question I ask everybody. Picture you're not you, you're not me somebody who's watched this interview and they found it very interesting with a lot of good points but there was a lot of material five days from now five days from now this person who you don't know is going you know i remember that interview and there was good stuff um but there was this one point the professor made at the end i i just can't get out of my head what is that one idea you want in rad, random average american to not be able to get out of their idea head in five days from now <clears throat> well, first, I'll say I'm glad that your last question was not, which is my favorite Star Trek, Captain, because I'm a Star Wars guy, not a Star Trek guy. So oh, uh, uh, haram, 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 haram. 
But what I would say is what people have to understand is um, there are no there are no political gimmicks that are going to solve this problem. That it comes about with people um, being responsible citizens um, and holding themselves and holding our government officials to a standard of uh, of fairness and judgment and decency rather than just judging everything by whether or not they like the political results that come out of it um that's what strikes me as the uh, the most important thing for the normal person the ordinary person listening to uh to the to this interview which is think about that right uh which is the political system reflects who we've become as americans um and we are the ones who have to do something about that. We'll end it there. Thank you, Professor. I will email you a copy of this interview in a little bit. Um, if you could, we would love to interview anybody that you know who may be open to having a discussion on political polarization. If you could think about that, send us any names. If you do, don't have to. I'll send you a copy of the interview in a few hours. We'd, we'd love to keep the conversation going if you know anybody. Um, one guy who I would suggest, if you can get time with him, yeah. is um, Peter Gettler, the president of the Cato Institute. Um, he's a very busy man, but uh, but he's given a lot of thought uh, to, uh, to to this. Um, and um, you can suggest that I, you know, give you give you his name. Um, he's given a lot of thought about these underlying frictions. Um, in society, and he's developed an initiative at Cato called Sphere uh, of sort of education, the education project for, for high school students. Um, and he calls it Sphere because a sphere doesn't have sides, right? It doesn't have oh, sides. Okay. So, uh, okay. And um, so I think it's kind of a neat, uh, I think it's a neat uh, initiative. So I would suggest Peter would be a, uh, would be one person who I would suggest talking to. So if you can get a hold of him. Done. If you think of anybody else, we'll go after them. I uh, really appreciate it. And I will email you a copy shortly. And thank you for thank you for coming out, Professor. Appreciate it. Well, well, great. Thanks. Thanks for a great conversation. Okay. I will email you shortly and I will talk to you soon. Okay, thanks. Good. Bye. Bye. Okay, that's it. And we'll see you soon.